Marc-Andre Leclerc was a Canadian-born alpinist who loved to spend every moment in the mountains. His story of risky solo ascents on some of the hardest mixed climbing routes on Earth is truly mind-blowing. Excelling at ice climbing, Leclerc was drawn to his hometown mountains in Canada while also taking several trips to Argentina to explore and climb in the Patagonia region. Today, we will tell the story of Marc-Andre Leclerc's adventures as they were truly some of the most groundbreaking and awe-inspiring ascents of all time. Born on Vancouver Island in 1992, but largely raised in a small agricultural town in the Fraser Valley, Marc-Andre Leclerc's family didn't have much money. His father worked construction and his mother was a stay-at-home mom for much of his life. The region he grew up in was not known for alpinism or climbing of any sort. If anything, it's notable for producing exceptional corn. But as a four-year-old, Marc-Andre was interested in just one thing, climbing. Knowing the height of Mount Everest to the foot and being able to recite the exploits of legends such as Edmund Hillary and Tenzing Norgay, Marc-Andre quickly turned into a climbing enthusiast. Learning at a young age that climbing was the only way to calm his mind, he advanced faster than most. And despite beating kids three years his senior in indoor climbing events, he pulled himself out of the climbing team in order to have more time to climb in the mountains. At age 14, he began to work construction with his father and saved up enough money to purchase some secondhand ice climbing tools. His interest in ice climbing quickly sparked the second he learned about it. Topping out his first multi-pitch ice route with a German man who was in his 70s, Mark andre was making advances every time he got out in the mountains. Getting to the trailhead any way he could, most of his climbing was done alone. Developing his technique and strength while climbing both rock and ice near his house, Mark andre learned from anyone and anything he could. When he did climb with others, he made sure to ask questions in order to pick up on any tips and tricks they may have, but he mastered most of his skills on his own building anchors in his room at night and constantly reading up on books in order to have the confidence to begin to solo hard routes. Leclerc finished high school at the early age of 17, spent a summer hanging drywall, and then moved two hours northwest to Squamish, where he would then meet his girlfriend Brett Harrington. The pair was perfect for each other, as all either of them wanted to do was climb. They started tying in together and soon were dating. Within a year's time, people knew if there was one thing Mark loved more than climbing, it was Harrington. They traveled on many trips to Baffin Island, Yosemite, and Patagonia, getting better and better while climbing with each other. On their first trip to Patagonia, Marc Andre achieved the first solo ascent on the Cerro Torres corkscrew route. At the same time, Harrington was free soloing another route just across the valley. Celebrating their triumph together that night, they were on cloud nine. Marc Andre was etching his name as one of the best alpinists of his time. At only the age of 22, other climbers began to know his name. The Cerro Torre corkscrew route is a link up that contains 200 meters of independent climbing out of the 1200 meter total to reach Cerro Torre's summit. The route begins on the southeast ridge of the mountain. This goes for about 14 pitches or about 800 meters to reach the ice towers. Here, Leclerc recalled it being very slow because of poor conditions, including rain, running water, and variable ice. From the ice towers, the route heads west over an ice field and meets up with the Ragni route for another 600 meters, following it to the summit. While Leclerc is humble and modest about the first solo ascent, a Patagonia local legend said, A solo of this magnitude is probably only second to Italian Renato Casarotto's first ascent of the Fitzroy North Pillar. That was said by Rolando Garabati, Patagonia's most respected climber and its de facto record keeper for accomplishments in the southern Andes. While local climbers and worldwide climbers took note of this ascent, in several interviews, Marc Andre expressed that he isn't interested in any accolades or anything of the sort. He just wants to have a good experience in the mountains. Solo climbing some of the hardest mixed rock and ice routes in Canada and Argentina, other climbers were forced to notice and give respect. Not only was Marc Andre climbing some of the hardest routes, but he was doing it solo with very little safety gear, if any at all. Racking up notable ascents from 2013 all the way until 2018, many climbers knew the risks he was taking weren't sustainable. Climbing many of these routes solo, with limited ropes and other means of protection on some of the most exposed terrain in the world, Marc Andre was living on the edge. In September 2016, he would go back to Patagonia and solo Cerro Toro's neighbor, Toro Egger. The line he chose on the East Pillar was even harder than the corkscrew route. Want the definition of badass, wrote Rolando Garabati? There you have it, as no one has ever soloed the Egger during the winter. This groundbreaking ascent truly cemented Marc Andre as one of the best alpinists of his generation. 
Choosing to free solo many iconic routes, such as these previously mentioned ones in Patagonia, he also achieved free solos of the Rim and Grand Wall in the Canadian Rockies, as well as the Northeast Buttress in the Cascade Ranges, while also having countless other free solo ascents across Patagonia and the Canadian Rockies. It is safe to say that Marc Andre left his footprint on climbing across the world. That brings us to March 3, 2018, when Mark Andre left Brett Harrington, heading out to climb the north face of the Mendenhall Tower in Alaska. While the pair was splitting up, they had just claimed the first ascent of a peak called Station D, which was about 50 miles from their home in southwest BC. The weather was so cold over those four days in the mountain that Brett Harrington quickly planned a trip to Tasmania to escape to warmer weather. Mark Andre wanted to pass the time while she was gone and had a few options. At first he thought about soloing Mount Waddington in the BC area. At 13,000 feet, it is the highest peak in Canada's coast mountains, but the conditions weren't lining up. The weather up in Juneau, though, was looking quite good, and he remembered an invitation he received a few months earlier from a 34-year-old climber named Ryan Johnson. Johnson, a Juneau local, was an Alaskan climber through and through. He had claimed that he could feel the difference between 80 and 100 mile per hour winds. And as a gold miner in southeast Alaska, he developed a reputation as a little guy who could outwork the big guys. Johnson had obsessed over the north face of the main Mendenhall Towers for years. The Seven Peak Granite Massif lies 10 miles north of Juneau. Over the years, Johnson had put up countless routes on all the towers, but the proudest and most obvious line was the unclimbed 2,500 foot north face. He attempted it once in 2015, but turned back when the ice got too thin halfway up. The route wasn't technically difficult, but it was extremely challenging to protect against a fall. The granite would be heavily rimmed like climbing on styrofoam, and though they'd be roped up, they need to climb as if they were soloing the face. It sounded right up LeClaire's alley. At 7 a.m. on Sunday, March 4th, a chopper chartered from a Juno outfit called Coastal Helicopters touched down on the Mendenhall Glacier. The sun had just come up and the weather was clear. The forecast called for a high-pressure system that wouldn't move through the area for at least three days, and the snowpack seemed relatively stable. The 2,500-foot north face of the main tower is taller than Yosemite's Half Dome. Even for Alaska, where everything is big, the face is enormous, and in the late winter it never sees the sun. The wall terminates at a series of crevasses that litter a 55-degree snowfield for a few hundred feet before aproning out into a flat expanse on the glacier. If a rock fell from the ridge or anywhere on the wall, it would plummet a couple thousand feet before bouncing down the snowy runout and coming to a rest a quarter mile from where it first landed. That's the approximate spot LeClaire and Johnson cached all their gear that they wouldn't need until the following day, after they descended the route. Their plan was then to ski 10 miles out on the West Mendenhall Glacier Trail back to Juneau. They planned to return by Wednesday evening the 7th at the latest. They didn't have much gear to cache, as both climbers were fanatical about moving fast and light over unknown terrain. LeClaire and Johnson stuck their skis in an avalanche probe in the snow and attached a reflective vest to the probe so they could see it from high up on the face. The climbing wasn't nearly as hard as some of the routes the men had completed in the past. They probably didn't talk very much, as when you have a good partner for an alpine climb, there isn't a lot to say. There are fleeting moments when both would have been at a belay stance, but even then, it's a quick changeover of gear, maybe a couple of words about the line, and then back to the business of putting one ice tool in front of the other. The sun set at 5.35 that night, and LeClaire and Johnson slept on the face, probably snacking on trail mix and using a small stove to melt the snow to drink. Their plan was to start climbing again at first light. Just before 10.30 a.m. on Monday, March 5th, LeClaire texted Harrington, who was still in Tasmania, saying, Love, I'm at the summit. It was an incredible climb. He sent her a few photos and posted to Instagram, captioning, Rare live update here, that is Mount Fairweather in the distance. Then he texted his mom an image of the surrounding peaks, saying, Beautiful. She responded with, Where are you? Meanwhile, Ryan Johnson took a video for his girlfriend, spinning in a circle to show her the cloudless view that stretched a few hundred miles. And then nothing. No responses, no texts, no calls for about two days. Mark Andre always called Harrington after he was out of the mountains to let her know that he was okay. But when Wednesday rolled around and he hadn't contacted her, she texted him. I hope you're making it back okay. It's been a while since your summit message. When she didn't get a response, she called Juno Mountain Rescue to check in. Juno, a town of about 32,000 people, isn't considered a climbing destination. The community of climbers there is small. Many on the Juno Mountain Rescue, or JMR, knew Ryan Johnson personally. Some had also teamed up with him to climb several other routes. Three years earlier, Johnson, though not a member of the crew, had saved the lives of four JMR members who had been pinned down on a ridge by a storm. 
By the time she called, it was Wednesday morning, March 7th. When one of the JMR crew members talked to her, he mentioned that the pair wasn't planning on getting back until later that evening, so they would wait. Maybe I jumped the gun on this one, Harrington thought. She played out the possible scenarios in her mind. If search and rescue deployed the next day and didn't find the Claire skis, it meant that the men were somewhere on the glacier and headed back to town. If they found their skis at the base of the climb, it meant that for some reason they were still in the mountains, unable to call for help or get themselves out of there, and that meant she was flying to Alaska. The next day, Gabe Hayden from the JMR called Brett to let her know that they in fact found their skis where they were stashed. It seemed the men never returned from the summit. Hayden told Harrington that a Sitka-based Coast Guard helicopter had flown out to the towers and scanned the north face and the surrounding glacier with an infrared camera. Trying to pick up on any signs of body heat, the search turned up empty. There were no bodies. The assumption from the JMR was that LeClaire and Johnson had descended the line they climbed up and had been swept from the face by an avalanche. It sounded to Harrington like that was it. They were calling off the search. She thought, we can't call the search off after just one day. This is not okay. She continued to book her flight and started planning her own operation. She then made a list of the gears she would need and locations to search. In fact, the search hadn't been called off, but by the time Harrington landed in Juneau on Saturday, March 10th, it was on hold. Instead, from their base at the Alaska National Coast Guard hangar, JMR began assembling a timeline through the text messages the men had sent from the summit. LeClaire's summit text to Harrington was sent at 10.26 a.m. His final text to his mom was sent more than an hour later. It was very unlikely that the men had spent that much time at the summit. Had they descended the same way they climbed, they would have lost service immediately. They must have descended another way. By this point, a small group of LeClaire and Johnson's family, friends, and climbing partners had assembled in Juneau. By the evening of Saturday, March 10th, the possibility that Johnson and LeClaire were still alive or stuck in a crevasse somewhere brought a small glimmer of hope and a whirlwind of activity to the rescue operation. But the helicopters were still grounded due to poor weather. The hurry-up-and-wait nature of the search left the climbers' families in an odd, liminal space. There was a lot of urgency, but not much to do about it. On Tuesday, March 13th, the sky went blue. It had snowed more than four feet in the six days since LeClaire and Johnson had been reported missing. With help from the Alaska National Coast Guard, the JMR took a Black Hawk helicopter out to the towers. While buzzing the summit, they spotted the nearly filled-in divots of two sets of footprints traversing the ridge heading east. The footprints ended at the top of a gully, where a line of cool blue ice dropped roughly a thousand feet from the ridge all the way to the floor. A small piece of black and white cord dangled at the top. The team then headed back to base and switched to an A-Star helicopter. Smaller and more nimble than a Black Hawk, the A-Star would allow them to get closer to the gully. It was also equipped with a reco detector, which uses radar to pick up metal or electronics. In a separate helicopter, Harrington monitored the A-Star's progress with the other members of the JMR. They then flew in close to the north face. Ribbons of ice coated the series of steep headwalls. Above that, snow ramps led to ridges and then to the summit. A cornice hung along the ridge, leading to the gully. At the bottom of the wall, part of an orange rope was visible. As the A-Star hovered above that core that they saw at the top, they were there for a long time. Brett Harrington thought, they're right here. She felt close, like she could reach them. Hiking in to check if LeClaire and Johnson were there and still alive wasn't an option. The hazard was just too great. They were less than half a mile from their skis. The helicopter turned and flew back to town. When they arrived, JMR members showed them close-up photos of the men's gear taken from the A-Star. An orange climbing rope was partially visible in the snow. According to the RECO search, the men were buried 15 feet below. Johnson and LeClaire were presumed deceased. Dying on rappel is common. Two climbers perishing at once on rappel is extremely rare. There's a chance that one of these men made a mistake while building the anchor or that they neglected to put stopper knots at the tail end of their ropes. Everyone makes mistakes, but those who knew the Claire and Johnson best consider those two options as vanishingly small. The two climbers were too methodical and careful. Of course, care doesn't always protect you in the mountains. Something could have fallen on them and severed the anchor holding them to the wall. It could have been a large chunk of ice or rock. An avalanche could have swept them down the gully. All three events can be triggered by a single person, by changes in temperatures, or by nothing at all. More than the breathtaking difficulty and audacity of LeClaire's climbs, it was his approach to climbing that set him apart. He was technically and athletically on the same level as someone like Alex Honnold, yet he largely flew under the radar. He preferred it that way. That's what blew my mind about Marc Andre's story. While he was doing and achieving some of the riskiest ascents someone could do, he was uninterested in any of the accolades or fame a regular person would want. That is the reason why I will always remember Marc Andre. May he and Ryan Johnson rest in peace.
The movie The Alpinist is about Marc-Andre Leclerc and does a great job of interviewing and giving us a window into his mind right before he perished. I suggest everyone go out and watch it. And that is the story of the final days of Marc-Andre Leclerc. If you are interested in more scary, fascinating stories, check out these videos.